Hello and welcome back to the Sightshed Podcast. My name is Matt Jones and today you're joining us for a bit of a shake-up episode actually. We're uh, breaking the routine a little bit here. As many of you know, I have been running book reviews um, on a YouTube channel, which means I have been reading a lot of really cool business books and I've just been uh, giving you my thoughts on them and helping you guys, I suppose, make a call on whether or not you want to go and uh, either listen or listen to them or read them yourself. Now, this book was so good that I've, uh, I actually have got the author on the um, podcast for this show, and we're running through some of the principles out of the book, and we're talking about how that might relate to uh, tradies and contractors alike. So I encourage you guys to um, definitely listen to the podcast. And then second of all, if you want to get more information, go and get hold of the book. The book is called The One Page Marketing Plan by a gentleman called Alan Dibb, who is an Australian entrepreneur, a very successful Australian entrepreneur. And the book is absolute gold. Also, folks, he has left behind some resources, which are going to be available both in the show notes and in the resource section of the Sightshed podcast. So make sure you go and get them because um, they are fantastic. There's some frameworks and things there that you can that you can get hold of. And the actual one-page marketing plan uh, framework itself is in there. So go get them. And guys, if you do enjoy the book, please, if you enjoyed this episode, I should say, please leave us a review. You can head across to iTunes or Stitcher, SoundCloud, Spotify, YouTube, blah, blah, wherever you listen to your uh, podcast, really. Uh, just leave us a quick review. It would be very much appreciated. And then if you got something out of this, go and send it to somebody that you think might benefit from it too, because it's all about spreading the good news. So uh, guys, I hope you enjoy this podcast. I loved recording it. Um, Alan is an absolute legend, and um, this uh book is seriously uh, it's like a bible man if you could see the if you could see my book right now with all of the dog-eared pages highlighter uh post-it notes that are hanging out of it and everything um that'll give you a pretty good indication of um of uh, how much i enjoyed it so i'm sure you guys will as well all right that's enough from me and this long-winded introduction let's jump right in so many of the things that alan and i spoke about in this podcast we actually do for clients across at tradedwebguys.com.au. Uh, what Alan was talking about, the nurturing campaigns and then the content creation side of things, like we actually do this stuff. So guys, if you want help with this kind of thing, head across to tradedwebguys.com.au forward slash apply, fill in the form and let's have a conversation because we're doing it for a lot of clients and it's working brilliantly. So why not you? giving tradies and contractors around the globe the tools to run a modern business. You're listening to Toolbox Talks from the Site Shed. Now here's your host, Matt Jones. Mr. Alan Dibb, welcome to the Site Shed podcast. Hey, Matt, it's a pleasure to be on the show. Mate, as divine intervention may be, uh, I have started a book review channel on our (laughs) YouTube page there and your assistant reached out to us uh, late last year and she said, oh, would you be interested in reviewing um, Alan's book? And (laughs) ironically, I'd already read the book. Um, It was my top pick for books last oh top there was top two actually i'll get to that in a second but um i absolutely love the book and um i thought it'd be great to get you on the show to talk about some of the principles that you cover off there i have literally written pages and pages of notes uh, as i do when i read business books and i've um also highlighted the heck out of your book and i've got little uh post-it notes all the way through it and dog-eared pages and all the all the telltale signs of a good book that i've read there's certainly there's certainly no doubt that I've that I've read a book. Um, <laughs> it's not the kind of thing you can re-gift to someone after I've been through it. That's for sure. <laughs> so, mate, great to have you on the show. Uh, our audience typically uh, trade-based businesses, and your book, the One Page Marketing Plan, sort of fit into a bit of a theme last year. I I was I have been discovering. Um, through various resources, books that I've been reading, podcasts that I've been listening to, people that I've been interviewing, success stories, so on and so forth, that one of the common trends is has been simplicity. And I think, you know, when we're running our own businesses so often, um, and I'm certainly guilty of this, even though I feel like I'm getting better, I'm still certainly not great at it. But, you know, I think we overcomplicate things. And through a lot of the things that I've been reading, a lot of the resources that I've been reading, a lot of the strategies that I've been trying to adopt, I've learned that uh, simplicity really is the key here. And um, your book, The One Page Marketing Plan, certainly uh, encapsulates a lot of that uh, philosophy. And then the other book that I really got a lot out of, which I'm sure you would be well familiar with, is The One Thing by Gary Keller. Uh, 
Jay Papson. <clears throat> so yeah, no, I really, I really love this book, and, I've, and I'm, I haven't reviewed it yet. I wanted to speak to you first, but I will review it because I, ab- I absolutely thought it was, as I said to you before, top top two books that I read last year. This the one page marketing plan, the one thing they both, um, they both were standouts for me. Um, so I suppose I'd love to hear a little bit of, so, about your story. I mean, obviously I know your story because I've read your book, but I'm um, a lot of the guys out there may have not. So if you can give us a quick, quick, quick rundown on, um, I suppose your background and a bit about your history, and then um, we might dive in a bit of a bit of a bit about the book and how that relates to I suppose business owners in a modern you know in, in a trade society and that kind of stuff yeah yeah for sure Matt so thank you so much for for the kind words about the book I, I hope my book was number one out of the two <laughs> but uh, either way it's a it's a high privilege to to hear hear that from from a reader so it's awesome well I'm, I suppose to be fair they're very complimentary <laughs> which, cool. which, which is which is an excellent um an excellent compliment <laughs> <laughs> no that's awesome that's awesome so look look my story i guess is fairly typical of most business owners i uh, i used to work for a boss um uh, I felt that I was much smarter than than the boss. Why should I work for this idiot i'm going to start my own uh, business and that's exactly what I did so you know, I went from working for an idiot to becoming the idiot, <laughs> idiot boss, and um, I've been there. Uh, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, and you know, little did I know that you know, I thought all you've got to do is be good at what you do, and I was good at what I do, which at the time was IT. And you know, I, I thought that's all you need to do to run a successful business. And you know, that took me on a, probably a decade-long, expensive, difficult journey. Um, I finally uh, learnt. After working with a mentor for a while, uh, that you know, at the end of the day, uh, yes, it's important uh, how good you are and the services that you provide. But no one knows how good you are until they've bought from you. Before they've bought from you, they only know how good your marketing is. And that was really the big mindset shift for me. And that really is what turned everything around for me with, with that business. Um, I ended up um, spending a long time and a lot of money learning marketing the hard and stupid way, which was through just <laughs> trial and error. <laughs> reading every kind of theoretical weird book that that's out there and and uh, anyway long story short through through expensive trial and error through expensive experience uh, i i finally i guess cracked the code to to marketing and particularly a particular branch of marketing called direct response marketing and you know that made all the difference for me so i ended up scaling that business uh, building it uh quite big, exiting it for more money than I'd ever seen in my life. And then I did it all again with another tech business, which was a telecom business. But this time I went from zero to four years later, being one of the top 100 fastest growing companies in Australia. And I exited that as well. And now I'm, I'm helping small business owners do the same thing, helping them with their marketing systems and grow, growth and scale. So that's my short story. <laughs> Fantastic. So, um, I mean, the book itself has... I mean, it's very well renowned, isn't it? I mean, it's won a lot of awards. It's 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 a bestseller across a number of different platforms. Can you tell us a little bit about, I suppose, how you turned that intellectual knowledge into the intellectual property, which is now standing in my hand? Yeah, look, it, it was really just a matter. I mean, I, I'm not from a academic background or anything like that. I'm a university dropout and all of that sort of stuff. But you know, I, I really wrote the book that I wish I had uh, when I was first learning marketing. You know. <laughs> I was reading all these weird books about these crazy kind of concepts, mostly written by professors or researchers and people who clearly had never actually run a run a real business. Uh, and, you know, uh, I just wanted to know, how do I sell more IT services? You know, I didn't want to know about all of these crazy concepts, engagement, branding, this and that, and all, all of the other. And, mm-hmm. you know, that, that seems to be what really dominates the, the marketing category, which is kind of just the more fancy they get and the more weird the concepts are, the, the better the, the book generally sells. So, yep. so I, I just wanted to put together a, a book that I wish I had that really just takes you from, you know, zero, assumes that you know nothing, to being to ending the book, having a really good framework for marketing and really understanding what the next steps are and how to plan out a marketing strategy for your business. So that's, that's really where it came from. I mean, a lot of the stuff you talk about in there is is quite factual, in the sense that you know there's this statistics that you've dropped in there in relation to, you know, I especially like that pie chart that you had in the book where it was talking about you know thirty percent of your audience are not interested in your product, thirty percent wouldn't take it if it was free, thirty. 
are interested, but not right now. Seven are open to buying and three are ready to buy, like all these kind of things. And I thought, man, that's really cool. But where, like, where did that information come from? Is that your own studies or is that stuff that you've, um, you've sourced from elsewhere? No, uh, as I mentioned, at pretty much on page one of the book, or, or, or almost none of the ideas in the book are my inventions. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, uh, I mean, I, I came up with the framework, which is the one page marketing flat framework, but that's about it. I mean, literally everything else, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, people who either been mentors in my life, people who influenced me um, through experience. But, you know, I did not invent direct response marketing. I'm quite upfront about that. The vast majority of the concepts in the book are not things that I invented, but they are things that ha- worked for me and they are things that worked for, for my clients. So I only put things in the book that I know work. I didn't put any theory or things that, you know, I think might work or something like that. So so I basically took all of the things that worked for me over a couple of decades of business experience and I put those in the book. But, you know, quite honestly, as I mentioned in the first page of the book, I did not invent the vast majority of those things. Yeah, yeah, cool. And so you've mentioned direct response marketing a couple of times now. Um, for the listeners out there that may not be familiar with that term, can you give us a quick rundown on what that is and then how it differs to what I suppose people might be used to? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. So d- direct response marketing is a, a branch of marketing. So uh, I guess backing up a little bit, there, there are pretty much two branches of marketing. So there's one that's kind of brand-based, that's kind of all about getting known and getting engagement and all of that. And that's the type of marketing you'll see like on billboards, you'll see big companies like Nike, Coca-Cola and all of that. They're basically just putting their brand, their logo, uh, all of that sort of stuff. And they kind of hope that, you know, if you see their billboards enough, if you see their TV ads enough and all of that, that you'll remember them when it comes time to, to make a purchase. And that's totally fine. That works really, really well for big companies who've got very big budgets, very big timeframes. And, you know, like I said, it works for big companies, but for small companies, you don't have enough firepower to go with that kind of strategy. So uh, you're typically working with much smaller budgets. You've got much smaller timeframes. You know, you've got maybe 10 grand to spend on marketing and you need to get 10 grand or 20 grand back in terms of uh, profits from that. So Mm -hmm. with that is uh, that kind of strategy is direct response marketing and direct response marketing is all about when you have an ad or you have a promotion or something like that you need to be able to track, right, we spent $1,000 on this ad and we got $2,000 back. Or And the ads have to make a particular offer. So, And that, the offer is not necessarily just to buy. The, the offer could be to, to call a toll-free number. The, it could be to opt in on a website. Um, it could be to get more information. It could be to buy as well. But the point is that everything's trackable. It makes a, a direct offer for a very specific problem. So, you know, um, let's say you unclog drains, right? <laughs> right. So you want it to be talking about something very, very specific rather than just, hey, listing a laundry list of services. Hey, we do drains, we do ins- new installations, we do commercial, we do residential, all of that sort of stuff. So direct response is very focused on a particular solution to a particular problem and then tracking what happens when you advertise in that kind of medium. I love, Alan, in the book, your uh, the section in there that, that talks about the importance of focus in relation to however you might refer to it. Like a lot of people call it niching or, yep. you know, targeting a specific area of your vertical or whatever you want to call it. But I mean, it's something that I've been banging on so much about over the years in the podcast and through the stuff we teach through the digital agency. Like so many guys come to us and they say, um, okay, we want to we want to run some marketing for our plumbing company. I say, okay, yep. cool. What's your specialty? And they say, well, plumbing. And I'm yep. like, from, from a marketer's perspective, that is a freaking nightmare. Whereas I mean, if somebody says to you, well, you know, I'm really, really good at, we get really good results from hot water installations, you know, that's mm-hmm. great because that's something that really can help you um, I suppose, become the expert in that field. Your book talks a lot about that. And I suppose, apparently, it's not a vertical specific thing. Apparently, this is common, you know, within business in general. Like people yeah. just get so, they try to be too much to too many people. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about, I suppose, your experiences with that? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, you know, the more general you go, the more firepower you have to have. And when I talk about firepower, I'm talking about budget. I'm t- talking about time frame. So, 
Um, you know, it used to be back in the day, you just spend a, a lot of money on mass media marketing. You you do a general service or a general product for, for the community and that would have been enough. But now with search engines, with social, with Google, everything is so fragmented and you really have to be thinking from the perspective of what's someone typing into that Google search engine. So it's highly unlikely that someone's just going to go into Google search engine and type in plumber or plumbing. They're going to be typing hot water installation, right? Or right or unclogging my drain or, or whatever. So the point is when someone lands on your page or, uh, or your website or your landing page or sees your ad, you really want them to say, hey, that is for me. You know, is that is so important because if you just say, hey, we do everything for everyone, we do all sorts of stuff and it's applicable to everyone. And, you know, it's, it's kind of counterintuitive because a lot of small business owners think, hey, I want to cast the net really wide. I don't want to exclude anyone, you know. Right. So I don't want to say I do only hot water installations because, hey, I do all of these other things too. But the point I say to people is, you know, you, you want your marketing to be hyper-focused. And that doesn't mean that, you know, if you do hot water installations, you can't take other business on. But in terms of your marketing and a particular campaign that you're running, you want to be hyper-focused focused on a particular problem. And look, when you dominate hot water installations, by all means, then start running another campaign, you know, based on whatever else, uh, fixing up showers or or, or whatever else. But the the point is one campaign, one focus and being laser focused on that, because that way you're going to speak to someone's problem and someone's needs. And that gets a far, far better response than just saying, hey, we do everything. We're the best. Give us a call kind of thing. And what I've found as well, um, Alan, is that if you niche yourself, like you were just saying then, you know, if you target a certain area of the, um, the industry, um, what I found over the years of working with trade business and what I found when I was running my own trade business was by, by no means does it mean you, you have to, you could disregard the other services you offer. Like if you do block drains, fantastic. Mm. If you, you know, you do all these other, all the other services, roofing, whatever it might be, blah, 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 that's great. But what, what I found was if by targeting hot water, Uh, it's easy to get your foot in the door and become sort of an expert within that area, which means once you're in the door, you then then have an opportunity to open up that conversation and educate the people about the other things that you do. But the reality is if you don't get your foot in the door initially, then you're never going to have that opportunity to sell them into the other services that you provide and offer. Of course, of course, exactly. And you know, th- that brings up a really, really good point because uh, a lot of people think that the, the marketing's over when the first transaction happens, but really that's a very, very difficult and expensive way to, to run a business. The, the, the best customers that you've got, uh, uh, the best future pipeline of business that you've got are customers who've already done one transaction with you or, or dealt with you once before. So, of course, if you've come and uh, if you've come and installed my hot water service and you've done a great job and you haven't ma- messed up my house and you've come on time and all of that, the next time I need a, a plumber to, to do anything, whether it might be a, a much bigger job or a smaller job, or whether I refer someone, uh, a friend or a relative, I'm going to be thinking of you. It's uh, really I'm I'm so glad that you're saying this stuff because when I say this stuff to my clients and to the to the listeners out there, I'm sure they sort of think, oh, here goes Matt again on his tangent, <laughs> Matt, talking about the same shit. But when it comes from somebody else, it really does give us strength. So, like we know, and this is so true with home service based organisations, especially. So, I mean, obviously, uh, with any business, you know, if you, if you've got a, if you've bought from somebody before, you know, like and trust them, then you're more likely to go back there. But with home service, it's ex- it's especially the case because to build trust and rapport and let people into your home, I mean, that's like a big barrier. In, there's a number of big barriers there. Firstly, it's security. There's a lot of trust and issues that are going on with letting people into your house. And typically speaking, if you've already addressed that barrier once and you've already done a good job and you've, they've let you into your house, they know you, they, can, they know they can trust you, all this kind of stuff, then like we know that you're 80% more likely to retain a client than to gain a new one in that space. And Oh, no doubt. No doubt. And, but the reality is like we have phone calls all day, you know, oh, we need more leads, we need more leads, we need more leads. And then we always say, well, how many customers have you served over the last five years? And they're, oh, I don't know, maybe 10, 12,000. You go, okay, and how do you communicate with them? Oh, we don't. So there's, this, <laughs> there's this churn and burn mentality, yes. um, which, is, which is fine. I mean, I'm not saying you don't need new leads, but like if you could apply just a, even a small percentage of the resource that you're using to get new customers in, apply that to retaining some of your existing customers, uh, the conversions are tenfold. Oh, no doubt. No doubt. I, I heard a really good quote the other day. It was, the best way to get new business is to speak to old business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so I, I'm, I'm glad you've just that you brought that up because it really it, it, it sort of solidifies, I think, what I've been talking about for so long. And it also makes me realize that, I mean, obviously, I'm so heavily entrenched in the trade industry and in the trade marketplace where I don't really get to I get, I get a whole lot of perspective from outside of that um, vertical, but then it obviously is, is congruent across the board. And just thinking about it from the uh, the homeowner's perspective, like, and now I've got a, a lot of good personal experience fr- from the client side. You know, I'm building a house at the moment, so I'm in the process of interviewing um, landscapers, and this is a decent landscaping <laughs> uh, job. It's uh, well into the six figures, and you know, and I, I'm interviewing landscapers, and you know, I just want a guy who looks like he knows what he's doing. Will send me a quote that looks like it hasn't been written by his six year old kid. <laughs> You know, I had to tell a guy, "Look, can you please add up the totals and put GST at the bottom?" Because he he didn't he didn't <laughs> even he didn't even bother. To, like I had to, there was like a hundred individual items, and there was no total at the bottom. And you know, I'm like slapping my head, like this is like a well over a six figure uh, job, and I can't get anyone to kind of just do very very basic uh, things. So from from a, a client perspective and a homeowner's perspective, every time I speak to a landscaper now. And I send him the landscape design. I'm thinking to myself, I really hope this is the guy because I'm just over over this. So yeah. you know, <laughs> really just think it through from a client's perspective. What do they actually want? Yeah, it, it's it is incredible. I mean, well, obviously, um, we're kind of preaching to the converted here because people we find that typically are listening to podcasts and they're you know they're part of our you know our massive Facebook community and all this kind of stuff. These are typically the people that are you know willing to learn and they love have adopted a lot of these strategies. You know especially in relation to like you were saying there, that's just, I mean, that's straight up business 101. That's just being professional. But it's its amazing how many people are not. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I, we're, probably, we're probably not really talking to the people that we need to be addressing in that scenario. However, yes. it is refreshing for, think, for the listeners out there to realize that a lot of their competition and a lot of their people out there that are competing on jobs and stuff against them uh, are really shit at doing this. Yeah, yeah. Look, if, if, and, you know, I say this to tradespeople all the time. If you do just very basic common things, it's going to be like shooting fish in a barrel for you. I mean, if you, yeah. if you turn up on time, if you don't mess up my house, if you yeah. send me a quote that kind of <laughs> I, I can uh, make sense of, uh, I mean, you're, you're probably in the top 10, uh, 10% of people in your industry, right? So it's going to make things much, much easier. Yeah, and I, I mean, I say it all the time. You know, if you, you, who are you going to let into your house? The guy that rocks up in a nice clean truck with a nice clean uniform is prompt. Yeah. He's got his, you know, he's got his iPad out ready to give you an official proposal. Can email it to you. You can sign off it on the job. Or the guy that rocks up, you know, in a beaten up old Ute with a ciggy in one hand and a coffee in the other and no uniform. <laughs> like yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> so no, it's good. And I, I noticed as well, you touched on something there, which I picked up in the book when you were talking about sales and it sort of ties in i suppose to that conversation around re-engaging but i i, I remember I, I can't remember the exact figures it was something like half of half sales people will give up give up um, yeah. after one attempt and i think it's 70 percent after two or something, or something yeah. like that anyway <laughs> but anyway at, at, but then by the end i think it was something like 80 percent of people uh of sales people give up after three percent after three attempts which in my opinion, leaves a huge window of opportunity there for, for anybody. I don't know if those figures directly correlate to trades, but I imagine they wouldn't be too far off. I mean, oh, I, know- look, I, th- I think in trades, it's pro- probably more so. And I don't know, maybe I'm, a, I'm in an area where trades are, are way too busy, but my experience is it's extremely rare for a tradesperson who's given me a quote to, fo- to ever follow up. Uh, and, you know, I, I wouldn't even say 50% of them follow up. Yeah. So, and, and again, I'm, I'm talking about high ticket items. Like I, I, I got a quote from a guy to, to do my floors and it was somewhere in, in, the, in the region of $20,000. Gave me a handwritten quote, never heard from him again. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, I just thought this is amazing. Like he must either have so much business uh, that it's not funny or, or, you know, he just really doesn't know what, he, what he's doing, you know. And it's very, very co- common that, that that is the case. So, you know, if you, if you do a few simple things like, you know, uh, put together a professional quote, if you can email it, that's a big plus. If you, if you can follow up because, again, people are not, you know, sometimes people will sign up on the spot, but sometimes, you know, they've got to talk to the wife, they've got to, you know, uh, have a look at it, maybe another couple of options, this and that. And, you know, it doesn't always come down to price, but if you, and, 
you know, in the busyness of life, you know, I, I'm, for example, I'm running a business, I'm doing a lot of, a uh, lot of things, I've got family and all of that, you know, so you're not necessarily at the top of my mind. So sometimes uh, I may have every intention of doing business with you, but life just got in the way. And all I need is a follow up phone call to say, Hey, Alan, um, you still good with that, that quote that I sent you last week. And uh, I'll say, yeah, let's, let's do it. You know, it's just, you know, it's just not been top of my mind. And, yep. you know, a follow up or two uh, is will make all the difference. It's such a profound problem with um, with our, our our customers and our clients and our audience that we've actually developed a follow up automation for um, an email marketing program, which basically takes a lot of heavy lifting out of the equation for them, but it ensures that they do it like it's so like no, no, very few of them are doing this very are doing this well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. And so, yeah, no, I, I completely relate to uh, to what you're saying there. It's just it's it's mind boggling. And and the fallback effects are it's it's not just the fact that you've got to keep quoting as well. I mean, there's so many different things that can result as a as a as a uh, a reaction, I suppose, to you not implementing some sort of follow-up process i mean like we were talking about branding before but you know you're not really putting yourself in a position where you've you're very reputable or you know you're very referable um if you simply can't follow up a proposal i mean you never know you never know what a simple phone call or a simple email can do for future business yeah yeah and, and i can like i said i can tell you from personal experience um where in the rare instances where someone has followed up a, a quote uh, you know the conversation has essentially been oh yeah sorry I, I meant to get back to you on that yep let's let, let's do it can you get started this week or next week kind of things so, so very often it's just that someone you know life's gotten in the way um and you know a fo- follow-up call or two that that will often do the trick and especially if you've done a, a lot of the other things right you know if you're if someone's not getting back to you in a in a trade-based business, you probably want to have a look at your overall process, how you're presenting yourself, how you're showing up, how you're differentiating yourself. Because like I said, in in trades especially, I find that the bar is so low that it's it's not hard to kind of stand out from the crowd. Yeah, no, I agree. We interrupt this podcast today to talk to you very quickly about Tradie Web Guys content creation program. That program has been designed specifically for trade-based organizations as a way that you guys as trade business owners can start creating content that enables you to engage better with your customers and your potential customers. It will enable you to build trust and build rapport because what you're doing is you're investing in educating them. The biggest problem that we see with our customers today is that they're not regularly updating their websites. And that's a problem because first of all, the search engines are looking for that. And second of all, potential customers are also looking for it. Trady Web Guys content creation program has been specifically designed to help you get regular, relevant content on your website consistently every month. We know that it's hard when you're out there on the tools, and we know that sometimes you don't always have the time to be able to do these things yourself. So we're taking it off your hands for you. It's a service that we're offering for you guys. We want to make sure that you're getting this done because we know how important it is. Anyway, head across to tradywebguys.com.au forward slash content, fill in the form, and one of our representatives will come back to you. Before we jump into some of the, um, the frameworks behind the, uh, the one-page marketing plan itself, I noticed there was uh, one of the common, I suppose, objections, or not objections, but a lot of the conversations that pop up in the group are often related to price and you know charging, and you know a lot of people want to up their price, but they're not quite sure if they if they can, if they should. And I, I know I, I, it stood out in the book where you were saying how 10% of your customers would willingly pay 10 times more and 1% of your customers are likely to pay 100 times more. Yes. And um, I thought, wow, that's so, that's so true. Like, I mean, it, so often I think we, we typecast a customer based off our, what, what we think is right when it's so far from the truth. Yes, yes, indeed. I, and, and I mean, it's not just about you, like, if you've given me no reason to why you're more expensive than the other guy, then of course it's going to default to price. You know, if I see, uh, you know, guy number one gave me 
uh, this price. Guy number two gave me that price. And I have no other way of differentiating the two. Yeah. That's what it's going to default to. But if you've given me a good reason why this is a higher price, you know, we, we use better quality products. Our people uh, are tr- well-trained. We follow this particular process. We have guarantees in place, all of that sort of thing. Then then it becomes an apples to oranges comparison. And, yep. I, I, you know, it becomes a choice for me. Do I want to take a risk with the guy who's cheaper or do I want to go with the guy who's really got his stuff together and gives me a lot more confidence and has explained to me why he's actually more expensive than than most of the, most of his other competitors. So one of the the big topics that that relates to for for our audience out there is for a lot of the guys that do project based work, a lot of builders and guys like that, they they spend a lot of time as you can imagine. I mean you're having a house built so you I'm sure you would definitely appreciate the amount of time that goes in to preparing and sending out a proposal is ridiculous for a builder. Like they, I mean, yes. I've got one of my clients who says like some, some of the bigger projects he does, it'll take him three days to quote a job. Yes. Now, why should they not be getting paid for that? for that time. And that's like a big thing at the the moment. Like these guys want to get paid for the time they're spending on these proposals. But like you just said, the reality is if you're trying to compete, like if you're going to go out there and say, well, we charge for a proposal and the next guy's doing it for free, then you're not really differentiating yourself at all from them. So one of the big revelations that these guys are starting to, um, you know, pull together and they're starting to frame up is if they can then pitch this proposal building as a product. So instead of, it's, mm-hmm. yeah, we, it's a proposal, but it's more a job analysis. It's like we'll break down everything for you. We'll give you the bill of quantities. We'll give you timeframes. We'll give you all this kind of stuff. We'll put it together in this amazing document. It's going to cost you 2000 bucks. If you decide to go ahead with us, then we deduct it from the cost of the project. However, if we don't, then you've got something that you can go and give to the next contractor and they can price yep. off it because that's what was happening anyway. Like yep. the customers were basically, the builders would put all this work into preparing this amazing yep. report. The clients would get it and they go, okay, I'm just going to give this to the other builder who's quoted on the job and see if he can beat it by 2000 bucks and then it's yep. yeah, basically done. So that kind of rings home very true, I think, to a lot of the listeners out there. Yep. Yeah, for sure. And that's, that's exactly uh, how I worked with my builder. So it, in the initial stages, when we were working with the architect, we were very broad strokes around, okay, you know, where do we want the garages? Where do we want the pool? All of that sort of stuff. And then when it came down to it, um, we put down a $3,000 deposit, which was which would have gone to, uh, to the um, towards the build uh, if we went ahead or forfeited if we if we didn't and we yep. were fine with that because you know we we felt comfortable that you know they uh, they knew our needs they knew what we wanted uh, we we'd spoken to a few few of their people so uh, and that's exactly that's exactly the way we we did it so yep. absolutely uh, there's no reason why you shouldn't package up your time in terms of design and and bill design and quoting as you know get paid for that absolutely yeah, brilliant. I love it. So, um, Al, let's just dive, Al, let's dive into the um, the one-page marketing plan. I love how you've uh, sort of broken it down into the three categories there. You've got the like the before, during, and after. So, before is obviously when they're a lead or they're not, they're not yet a customer. Uh, the during is when, I suppose, they're uh, – oh, sorry. So, before is when they're a prospect. Uh, yep. During is when they – are effectively what we call a lead inverted yep. commas, and then but obviously when they become a customer, which is after. Now, I think that alone is that framework. If you can get your head around um, the fact that there are different stages within that sales cycle, which are going to require different communications, different strategies, different all these different things. Um, I think that alone is gold. Um, a lot of people sort of neglect that. They sort of think I need more leads. Let's get more leads, but they don't actually consider that sales cycle. Yes. Now. So in in the in the beginning stages, like before before they're um before they're a lead, before they're a client, um obviously, I mean you dive into the book a lot about understanding your target market. We've spoken a little mm-hmm. bit about niching. Mm-hmm. So maybe we could talk a little bit about avatar and um, understanding who your market is, um, so that you've got a firm grasp on you know the communications and the language that you can use and you know to to reach those people. Yeah, perfect. Um, so, uh, so yes. So the before the before phase of the the one page marketing plan. That's when someone basically doesn't know that you exist. So uh, they they're potentially a prospect. They're a potential addressable market. And so the key in that state in the before phase is first of all to really hone down your target market. So 
who are you serving? And that could be bounded geographically, especially if you're in a trade. So you might be working in a particular geographic area or, or a radius. Um, then you might niche down. You might say, right, I, I really want to target these higher end neighborhoods in this, in this radius. And then you might niche down even further and, and you, might, you might find that a particular demographic are, are people who you love to work with. They're usually not very price sensitive. They, they you know, they, they're easy to deal with, that sort of thing. So really getting, getting that down. So it's funny, I was working uh, with one of my high-end coaching clients um, and uh, I won't mention his industry, but uh, he's, he's in trades and he runs a very successful trade business. And he noticed that the perfect prospect for him was someone who'd recently painted their house, right? So, uh, so now he he, uh, he has someone going through various uh, neighbourhoods that he targets, looking for houses that have been freshly painted. So that's his perfect target market. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, you know, get, getting down to that level where you you really understand who your who your perfect target market is, and you have a sense of that from your past history. You'll know, okay, uh, yeah. this this type of person they're always arguing about price. They're trying to get me down to the last dollar. Whereas this other person, you know, easy to deal with. We'll go ahead with any reasonable price that I give them. They're good to work with. I, I love working with those kind of people. So really hone downing your, your, your target market. And again, this, is, this doesn't mean that you're going to necessarily exclude other types of business that come your way, but this is, these are the people who you're focusing on when it comes to your actual marketing and uh, marketing campaigns. And yeah, so- I think, I think as well, like you've raised a, uh, a, a point there, which, well, you didn't really raise a point, but it, it brought something to my attention. You know, when you, when you have a clear understanding of you know, of that avatar and of that, you know, ideal client or say, for example, your client that, you know, okay, I realize that uh, people that just have their houses painted, they are ideal customers for me. Like it opens up a whole world of possibilities in the space of referral marketing and, you know, start, start striking up um, uh, like strategic arrangements with other companies and all this kind of stuff. Uh, whereas if you, if you don't have a clear understanding of that you know it's hard for you to go on a page approach painting companies and say hey listen uh, we'd like to build a relationship with you this is yeah. what you do blah 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 this is why i want to work with you guys it just opens up so many possibilities it does it does i mean and there's great possibility for doing lead exchanges with you know some someone who's in a painting business so he'll send them lead because you know they're in a complementary business but they're non-competitive so so he'll send them leads for people who need a paint job and and back the other way. Um, you can also potentially do a deal where you might give a finder's fee or something like that. So uh, helping a, a non-competitive but aligned business monetize their existing customer base as well. So it's a win-win yeah. for both. And, and I mean, it's it's a different conversation completely, but um, you know, you're, you're likely to get an extremely larger conversion from uh, a referral partner who the client already has a, an existing trust relationship with. Yeah, absolutely. And I recently recorded some podcasts with um, Michael Griffiths. He's the uh, referral marketing guru. And that was one of the things that he um, picked up. Well, one of the things he mentioned, he said, you know, your, your conversions will be a lot higher. And this has been my experience as well, definitely. You wear referrals that come through uh, strategic partners, the conversion on them is far greater than, you know, the conversion that might've come out of a cold Google ad or, or a Facebook app or something like that. Of course. So, okay, cool. So we've sort of that, that we've sort of um, addressed that uh, understanding who your target market is, and then I think like messaging and reaching out to that person. That also is something that you a lot of people. I won't say struggle with, but I will say they kind of get the messaging wrong. Like you know, they might be like a prestige builder, but mm -hmm. the language they're using is really targeting you know, like <laughs> the, the lower end of the market or I mean, it, it kind of comes, it's obviously the next step when you, once you understand who your market is and you really want to make sure that your, mess, your, your message to them is, is relatable, right? Yeah, correct. And, and that your message is really about them. You know, so many times in, in almost all industries, but particular trades, uh, they, they talk about themselves. They say, look, yeah. my granddad started this business. We've been in business since 1950, blah, 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 all of this. No one really cares about that stuff. People care about, you know, what can you do to solve my problem? So speaking to people from the perspective of the problem that they have and how you can solve it, how you can take them from pain to pleasure. So uh, that that's re really what it's about, and really getting it, uh, really hitting the the points that they're concerned about. You know, and you know, uh, if you're not sure what your target market is concerned about, 
just reach out to them. Just 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 interview a sample of your past clients and just say, you know, why did you hire me? You know, what were the things that, that made you hire me versus some, someone else? What were the things you were concerned about? A really cool question to ask is, why did you almost not hire me? <laughs> you know, if, if there was any any reason uh, behind that. So, you know, and they might, they might have said, oh, well, you know, uh, uh, your quote was really good and all of that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, I, w- I wasn't sure that you would be able to complete on time as, as you uh, promised. So, you know, really having a good understanding of what are the buying triggers in your target market and, and hitting those. So be more customer and problem focused rather than you focused. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that raises a really good point as well. You know, be, be willing to uh, accept and take comp- uh, feed, like feedback regardless mm-hmm. of whether it's positive or negative. Like at the end of the day, you, you want to be able to improve your services. So, I mean, I know a lot of us like to sort of stick our heads in the sand if something hasn't gone gone the, the right way, but the reality mm-hmm. is um, you, you can't learn from that, you know. The, and to be fair, you can't lead for, you can't learn much from consistently positive feedback all the time as well. Like you want to know the things that you can do, that you, things that you can improve within that engine. Yep, for sure. Um, and then I suppose that ties in perfectly to you know the media or the medium that you're going to be using to speak to those people. Obviously, if your customers are retirees, you're not going to be running Facebook ads. So uh, I suppose understanding uh, understanding where those customers live, where they spend their time, and then finding out what what mediums and what areas you can or what what sources are going to be is going to get the best interaction from them. So that that's that's kind of the next part of your uh, of your one page marketing plan. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, cool. So then you go into the during stage and um, something we've spoken about a lot on the show, which is basically the, the way that you're capturing leads, the way you're nurturing them and then the way that you're, um, I suppose, taking them from the point of being a prospect or a, or a lead into a customer. I love that. I love this whole this whole framework in the middle there. So can you talk to us a little bit about, um, I mean, obviously we run a web, web design company and we do you know, yeah. lead generation, things like that. And uh, we try as as best as we can to communicate the importance of uh, capturing data and building the inverted commas asset of the business mm-hmm. being the database yes and then um, in implementing like a communication structure relative to where they might be in that sales cycle if it's a if it's a lead or a prospect if it's a client they'll get spoken to in different ways so um, in my experience you know having something on the website where they can they can get hold of that which can put them into some sort of education or nurture funnel yep. uh, seems to work quite well for trades it might be yep. a report on yep. you know, the top five things you can do to prolong the life the, the life of your timber deck or something like yep, that yep. Um, and, and, and those sort of documents as well we find are quite useful even if you want to run like a facebook campaign or an ad or something like that you know you yep. can kind of use the same lead magnet you can kind of leverage it in different ways is that kind of the framework that you would typically go down as well yeah very much so 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 the during phase is all about when someone kind of indicates interest and they're a potential uh prospects. So they've either maybe given you a call, they've um, submitted a form on your website, or they've opted in on your website, and they want to know a little bit about um, what you've got to offer, or they, they want to know, uh, you know, uh, get you to come in and quote or, or whatever it is. So that really, you know, there's three parts to that. There's capturing the lead, there's nurturing the lead, and then there's finally converting the lead and, and taking them through that process. So, so it depend, depends, I guess, what you do, but you know, sometimes uh, if you're doing uh, things that uh, are a little bit higher in value, for example, you know, if I was to pull something out again because I've I've been having that personal experience lately, um, <laughs> I've been cho- choosing a pool guy, right? Yeah. So that's not a decision that I'm necessarily going to make right there on the spot. I want to have a look at a few proposals. I want to look at a few designs and that sort of thing. So um, I finally settled on a guy. I actually met him on site yesterday. We went through where he's going to dig and what he's going to do and where we're going to put the pool gear and all of that sort of thing. But, you know, a really useful thing that, you know, he, he could have done. I mean, he's, he was very good, very professional, everything like that. And I'm, uh, I'm highly likely to, to go ahead with him very shortly. But it would have been handy, I think, if... Once I became a prospect, once I indicated interest, if he had to put me on my, my his mailing list and he kind of, you know, had an automated sequence that took me through all of the options. So maybe he talked about, you know, what kind of uh, tiling or tiling versus rendering, you know, concrete yeah. versus the other, the other option. I kind of remember what it, what it is. Like shock, shock rate, fiberglass. Yeah, yeah, almost, yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. You know, you know, options around pool gear, you know, uh, telling me, okay, you know, pool gear can get a bit noisy. So maybe you build a little bit of a shed uh, somewhere 
wear out of the way and all of that? Because these are all questions I had. We, we literally spent an hour on site yesterday yep. through a lot, of, a lot of these things. So had he educated me through that process prior to us getting there, you know, I could have potentially gone on site yesterday and, and said, right, let's let's sign this off. But I'm, I'm now kind of looking into all of these things and researching it myself. So uh, if you can make it the research component and the fact getting com- component much easier for your client, then that's going to make the sales conversion much, much easier. You know, So if you've done all of the steps up until that stage, so if you've selected your target market, you've got the messaging right, you've selected the right media, you've done a bit of lead capture and lead nurturing, the sales conversion side becomes very easy and natural. It's like, all right, well, you know, I've got all the information, I've got all the quote, you seem pretty good. Yeah, let's let's work together. You don't you don't have to do any kind of weird closes or high pressure tactics or any of that sort of stuff. It just becomes a natural fit, right? You know, I, I, I've got all my information, I've got the design, I've got everything. Let's let's get started. <laughs> it's funny as well, Alan. Um, I, I know it's certainly been my experience. I'm sure it's probably been yours as well. And I know for my clients, especially, um, it's definitely the case where like so many of these conversations are exactly the same. Mm. And mm. so it is so easy to build out a useful document or resource. I mean, it doesn't have to be a document. It could be a five-part video series that could be dripped out over the course of two weeks. It could be a yep. you know a PDF. It could be a white label. It could be a report or whatever it is. But it's like so so many of these conversations that they're having are exactly the same. And so having that resource available to them, which addresses those problems. I mean, like you just said, then if your pool guy came up to you and said, "Hey, Alan, you probably got a lot of questions in relation to yep. uh, the stuff about building the pool." Here's a little document we prepared which might address some of those questions. I mean, you would have signed him up on the spot. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. But instead, we, we had to have an hour of conversation and we're still probably not quite done. We're, we're like, okay, do we use a gas heater? Should we use solar? Should we do both? Yeah. Do we have a pool blanket? And, yeah. you know, the thir- you know, because you know, it's quite windy where, where we're building at the moment, so you get a lot of thermal loss. So, you know, all, all of that sort of stuff. You know, one email per, per topic would have really helped me out, you know, so – you know, okay, one one email topic could be, okay, what are the options for heating a pool? There's gas, there's solar, there's a combination of both. You want to make sure that thermal loss isn't uh, too much of an issue so you can have a blanket. And, you know, with the pool blanket, there are a couple of options. There's kind of the big ugly roller that you have at the top or we can have a concealed one that, that can just slide out. So, yeah. you know, all of these things were things, you know, I, I kind of have had to prompt and, and ask rather than him being a little bit proactive, even though he's a really nice guy, seems really competent, does beautiful work and all of that. And like I said, I'm highly likely to go with him, but the sales cycle has gone on longer than it should have it, it, had he been much more proactive. And it, it's kind of as well, it ties in strongly, like we, we're forever trying to help, you know, the, the listeners, our clients, et cetera, with, I suppose, building an authority and becoming a bit of an expert within their vertical. And something like that, something like you've just said then, like, so we put a lot of focus on helping guys with content and creating content. And what you've basically just said there is so, such like a no brainer for them to, to get in that content space. Mm. Um, it's a paradigm shift for them though because now they're thinking, oh no, all I'm doing is answering questions. But then in reality, like those questions that they're answering are just like golden nugget after golden nugget of potential content opportunities. Of and course. so, I mean, if they if you go to, if they say, oh yeah, Alan, actually here's a whole bunch, here's a YouTube uh, uh, playlist that we've created on, on on six out of the 10 questions that you just asked there, go and check those out and I'll address mm. the other ones. I mean, you're just going to be blown away by that. Absolutely, absolutely, and it saved me a lot of time, and and it'll it's going to shorten the sales cycle because right now I've been talking to him for months, and he's probably thinking, you know, why isn't this guy signing up and all right. this sort of stuff? And it's just because I haven't got all the information right now, and you know, I don't want to just write a blank check. I want to know, okay, uh, this is how much it's going to cost, yep. and uh, you know, this is what I'm going to get, and understanding all all of the facts. So I'm not delaying it because just for the sake of delaying it, you know, I've got better things to to do with my time, but I I need to know all of the facts. I need to know where things are going to go and all of the options and uh, understand all of the different variations. So once once I'm satisfied with all of that, I'll, I'll be signing on the dotted line. And ironically as well, he's probably thinking, my God, this guy's asking so many questions. Why yes. won't he just go ahead? But then they'll go to the next job and he'll probably have the same experience. He'll be going, God, why are so many people asking so many questions? Whereas yes. If he had that resource prepared and he could, he, you know, he could approach the customer and say, right, here it is. Yes. Um, like he would save himself a, an amazing amount of time and the client as well. Yes, so absolutely. Think, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So the list is out there. Go and do what you said. Done. And then, of course, so the last part of the, um, uh, the, the marketing plan here is once they are a customer, 
I mean, this is as well, I mean, we've sort of touched on it before, you know, once they're a customer, a lot of people think, okay, that's the end of it, let's just leave it there. But it's so far from the truth. I mean, that really should be where the main things start kicking off in terms of <laughs> retention and you know, yep. n- nurturing and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, I mean, obviously you've got the first part is there, how can I deliver a world-class experience? Yes. Um, and I think what you've just spoken about in, in just previously there, I mean, I think that would certainly sort of add to that, you know, delivering that experience starts, you know, back when they're a lead, um, making sure that you're, or I mean, effectively it starts when they're a prospect, doesn't it? I mean, it does, it does. Yeah. It starts when it starts when, with their, when they're a prospect, but particularly when you're delivering uh, services, uh, I mean, if you can, if you can wow them, if you can give them an experience where literally it's remarkable. So remarkable means they'll remark on, on it. They'll tell other yep. people about it that, you know, so someone can say, you know, if I when I'm getting together with my mates, hey, what did you do on the weekend and all of this sort of stuff? And, you know, if someone's done a fantastic experience or someone's done a terrible experience, they're probably the two things I, I, I might remark on, right? So I might yeah. say, look, this guy did a terrible job. Make sure you never hire this guy. You know, he just uh, messed everything up. Uh, didn't come on time, all of this sort of stuff. Whereas conversely, if someone's done a great job for me, I'll say, hey, look, if you ever need an electrician, I- I've got the guy because th- this dude, he came in, he d- did an awesome job, charged reasonably, you know, ca- showed up on time, all of this sort of stuff. So, you know, create an experience where people would be happy to refer their their friends because and it kind of comes down to the to the psychology of referrals. A lot of people think, you know, if I ask for referrals or, you know, I'm asking someone to do me a favor and that's not the case at all. Like people do referrals for selfish reasons. Like if you have a think about the last time you referred someone a a really good restaurant you enjoyed or a really good movie you saw, you weren't trying to do a favor to the restaurant or you weren't trying to do a favor to the movie chain. You were, you had a great time and you thought your friend would have a really good time if they went in as well. And that makes you look good. So if you can create that kind of experience for someone where they will refer you because you've created such a great experience and they will refer you for selfish reasons, not because they want to do you a favor. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point. <laughs> yeah, no, it's very valid. And then I suppose that, uh, and then you go into the, the lifetime value of the client, which kind of ties into what we were speaking about where, oh, okay, I've delivered my service, we're done. Yes. Where, I mean, I was sorry, I should go back as well. When you were talking about, you know, delivering that experience, if guys, if, if you could just spend one hour just strategizing and planning out that journey, just sit down there and jot it down on a, on a back of a coaster if you want, whatever. But like what in your history within your business has got the best feedback from your clients and so just just jot it down because that even just doing that is so powerful like under like creating a bit of consistency throughout how that journey looks a lot of guys do this really well a lot of guys don't a lot of guys just go into it ad hoc every time and they just sort of shoot from the hip which i think is a is a massive mistake like just spending a little bit of time planning that that journey um, can be such a powerful tool would you agree with that i would i would absolutely agree with that and then of course going into that lifetime um, value discussion there where you know just looking beyond the sale and looking how you can further add value to that customer beyond what you're beyond that what whatever it is you've sold them and that doesn't necessarily in my experience alan have to do with um it's not necessarily you flogging your services to them it might be how you could i mean like you were saying with your painter uh with your your colleague that has um or your client i should say uh the, you know his best best clients are um, people that just have their house painted. Like, you know, if, if you were that painter, then that would be, that, I would throw that into that basket. You know, oh, I've got mm-hmm. X, Y, Z who he, he specializes in doing this for homes that have just been painted. Like that as well is increasing the value and the lifetime value of that client because they're likely to come back to you if they keep having good experiences. Oh, no doubt. And the other thing, just, just thinking through you know, your future pipeline of business. Like if you've done some work for me and if I'm happy, why don't you keep in touch with me with just a a simple email newsletter? What are the chances I'm only ever going to need a plumber once in my life? I mean, (laughs) uh, highly unlikely. It's it's likely one day I'm going to need a plumber again or one of my friends will or whatever. And it's funny, actually, an, an electrician that we had, we just got him to come and replaced a couple of light fittings, very small job. Uh, he came in, but he put us on his email newsletter. And, you know, I, I get his newsletter maybe once a month. And, you know, it, it's just kind of cool stuff he's doing. He's installed some CCTV system that kind of has a big Zoom yep. function and all of that. And I stay on his newsletter. And I, I bet I'm going once I move into my new place, I'm going to need someone, uh, an electrician. And he's, he's now top of mind. Now, had he not added me to his mailing list, 
I would have forgotten all about him, forgotten the name of his business, forgotten him completely. And I probably would have just Googled uh, electrician in the area that, that I'm in and he, he would have lost me. Whereas now I'm moving into a brand new house. I'm going to be installing home automation. I'm going to be installing CCTV, all of that stuff. Guess who's top of mind? Exactly right. And that is just, I think you just, I've, I've been saying this for so long and I'm so glad you just said that because you've basically taken the words out of my mouth. But it's, it's so important that guys understand the importance of just that communication pattern and just, just, just being present, like being front of mind. Like it's such, so valuable. And, and you may not think it is being valuable. Like you might think, oh, well, I'm not getting any replies to my email, so it's not working. But like you just said, people don't reply to emails because it's not because they're not interested. It's just because they're, maybe they're enjoying the, con- the content. Maybe they're, they're engaging with it. Not everyone's going to reply to it, but it doesn't mean it's not working. You know it's not working if they unsubscribe, which is fine, but you've tried. <laughs> yeah, look, and look, unsubscribe does, also doesn't mean it's not working. It may, may be just that you're not delivering kind of compelling content. Like, right. You know, if he, if he was just sending me stuff about, you know, electrical parts and all of that, I probably would have unsubscribed. But, you know, the stuff that he sends is kind of interesting. You know, like he's, yeah. he's showing CCTV systems that like he, he had one where it, it like uh, he showed a, a, a zoomed in picture of a boat because uh, I'm, I'm living by, by the water. And then he zooms out, zooms out, zooms out. And you see that the boat is miles away. So he's got this CCTV right. system that, you know, can zoom in a, a a whole, uh, you know, a big, big sort of distance, and that kind of caught my attention. Really creepy, really, yeah. really, really, <laughs> really appeal to the creepy people. <laughs> well, it was designed, I think, for more for, for you know, uh, cliff edge houses on the on the water. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, I guess you could get creepy if you really wanted. <laughs> 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 Whatever floats your boat. <laughs> Pardon the pun. Exactly. So, yeah, it's, com- it's compelling content that's going to get people's attention. And, you know, very often compelling content is not necessarily, you know, to you it might, might be quite mundane. But to, to me, uh, I thought that was really cool. And um, so I look forward to the different gadgets that he features uh, each time. Sometimes it's some, some home automation gadget or something like that. And, you know, it keeps my attention and I'll, I'll keep subscribed and it keeps, uh, keeps him top of mind. It's amazing because we've, um, we work with loads of, our, loads of clients there with the content space we went down this path where you know at one point we were helping guys like uh, trades people with blogs like industry blogs for the website and we, we just realized that nobody really uh, pardon the pun again gives a shit about a plumber's blog like no one wants to read a plumber's blog mm. but if you come to me alan and you you're after a new hot water system and i've got a you know a bunch of case studies or projects that i've actually delivered which tell a story about the job the type of system we use problems we overcame all this kind of stuff like that's going to be interesting to you because you can see that first of all we're not making this shit up we've been, we've done it like it's it's here like it's actually been done there's a testimonial on the on the page like all this kind of stuff it tells a story and second of all it builds a bit of social proof in the space of you know we're we're investing in our clients education because we want them to feel like you know we want them to have a good experience we want them to appreciate the fact that we this isn't our first rodeo yes um, and then with those pages as well, of course, there's the serendipities in the space of, you know, search engine optimization and all the geeky stuff which come as a result. But I mean, primarily, you know, the, the focus there for like what, what we love to help our guys do and the message I want to I constantly try and communicate to the listeners out there is you guys are doing cool things. Like you are doing interesting projects and it's yeah. stuff that people are, that they want to know more about, which is why they've come to you. Now, if you've got a product which is a slightly long sales cycle, say you're a, you're a builder or, you know, you do decks and pagolas and all this kind of stuff like the sale that from the time when people will first contact you and the time they're ready to buy i mean that could be 12 months 24 months 36 months like you don't know so if you've made a conscious effort to educate them about things that you've done along the way or interesting projects that you've carried out like like you said before alan they're going to be it's going to be front of mind they're going to appreciate that and they're going to engage with it mm. Absolutely, absolutely, and 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 stuff that you might find find mundane is, is can be very interesting to your client base. Absolutely, absolutely. So, I mean, I, again, I just encourage the guys out there, like, don't think that what you're doing isn't cool. Like, yeah, okay, cool, you're a plumber, but like, look beyond that and look at the projects you're delivering and look at the type of customers you know you're helping and look at the things you the, the issues that you're addressing because other mm-hmm. people are having those same problems, and that is like a content dream. Yes. Yes, indeed. Alan, I'm not going to keep you any longer. Thank you very much for your time today. Um, it was, it's been a great conversation. Um, I'm sure the listeners are going to absolutely love this. The book is called The One Page Marketing Plan. You can get it pretty much anywhere, can't you? 
Yeah, it's uh, it's available at most bookstores, Amazon, of course, um, in Australia, Dimix, um, Booktopia, all of the usual places. So yeah, grab a copy of the the book. Um, it's you. audio as well, yeah. Uh, audio b- book as well on Audible. So um, yeah, or or Kindle, of course. So whatever your preferred platform is. But my experience with um, audio books for business is I will download and listen to them, and then I have to go and buy the book so I can actually go through the framework. I don't know if you relate to that, but I, I do. I, if I listen to if I'm listening to just a normal book, I'm fine. I can listen to it and, and I enjoy it. And if I go listen to a business book, I'm like, God damn it! Now I'm gonna have to go buy it as well. <laughs> so, um, guys, I encourage you to go and actually buy this book uh, because Alan's got a whole bunch of frameworks within here um, that you can follow and um, do what I do: get a highlighter out and start writing all over them and just make it your Bible. Alan, you have left a bunch of resources available. There's the book summary. There's the one one page marketing canvas, um, which is going to be available through the resources. Uh, there'll be a link to that on the page for this podcast as well. So guys, go and check that out because it is very useful. Alan's also, uh, we've got a bit of a promotion coming up where we're going to give away a few books within the Facebook community. So keep an eye out for that, guys, if you're in the group. And if you're not in the group, then get in it. Uh, it's free. Uh, just go and search the, uh, the site shed on Facebook and um, Talia will let you in after you answer a couple of questions. Alan, anything you wanted to add, mate? I think that's about it. I think we, we've, co- we've covered a lot. Um, re- really, um, uh, the message I would give is, you know, become a good marketer of what you do. I mean, start stop thinking of yourself as someone in, in a trade. Stop thinking of yourself as a plumber, electrician, builder, whatever, and start thinking of yourself as someone who markets plumbing, electrical services, and building services. And that is going to absolutely revolutionize your business. I love it. And um, if people want to get hold of you, uh, they can head across to successwise.com. Is that right? That's it, successwise.com or grab a copy of my book on Amazon or wherever books are sold. And um, there's the successwise.com forward slash 1PMP. That's right, one page marketing plan, yeah? Yep. So that's it. the uh, does that, that that takes you to the book? I'm guessing that takes you to the book. Yep. Okay, fantastic, uh, mate. Thank you very much for your time, listeners. I know you're going to love that. So, um, by all means, please, if you've got any questions or if you want to reach out to Alan, go and do it. I'm looking forward to hearing what your feedback is. I know a lot of you guys have read this book as well, so I'd love to hear what you guys took from it. And uh, Alan, yeah, thank you very much. It was a pleasure to be on the show. Rock and roll. That's a wrap. Thank you for listening to another episode of Toolbox Talks. If you're liking what you hear, then you can head across to the siteshed.com where you can join our community by signing up to our Toolbox Talks. Uh, You'll get sent a weekly notification, which is basically a highlight of everything that we've spoken about during that week, along with any other industry news that may be relevant or specific to the trades. If you're enjoying the show, you can head across to iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud where you can leave us a review. Uh, That would be fantastic, and all the reviews get read out in the show. Uh, Likewise, if you have any friends or colleagues that you think would benefit from the show and the, the episodes that we create, then please go ahead and share it with them.